Hi, I'm Ning Yan. I'm a professor in School of Medicine, Tsinghua University, Beijing, China. Welcome to my iBiology seminar series. In part two, I'd like to share with you one major research in, uh, interest in my lab, that is the structure elucidation of one very fundamental physiological process, the cellular uptake of glucose. We all know glucose is the primary energy source to most of the lives on, on Earth. From the textbook of biochemistry or cell biology, you all learned how glucose is burned to release energy to support life. We know through glycolysis, one glucose molecule is split to two pyruvate molecules, and during this process, two ATP molecules are generated. And in the aerobic conditions, the pyruvate molecules are further uh, burned through TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle and electron transport chain to uh, generate carbon, carbon dioxide. And during this process, I mean, if it's complete metabolism, then one glucose can be used to produce over 30 ATP molecules. That is uh, the energy currency for all lives. However, before the metabolism of glucose, there is also one critical step, that is to take the glucose into the cell. From part one, I already told you that glucose is highly hydrophilic. That means they are water soluble. However, the cell is surrounded by the hydrophobic lipid bilayer. So glucose cannot enter the cell through free diffusion. There must be different uh, proteins to mediate this process. These proteins are called glucose transporters. So as we see here, glucose transporter is important in, uh, it's essential for cellular uptake of glucose. And um, throughout the years, we have identified different types of glucose transporters. And among the, and the more glucose transporters are being identified. But among all of those, the most rigorously characterized ones are called GLUT, as shown here, G-L-U-T, glucose transporters. So um, in human bodies, um, there is a huge family called major facilitator superfamily, and the GLUT belong to this family. Even within GLUT family, there are 14 different isoforms that exhibit tissue specificity and the substrate specificity. As summarized here, um, for example, GLUT1 functions in brain and red blood cells, and GLUT2 is for liver. GLUT3 is also called neuronal glucose transporter, indicating that they function in neurons. And GLUT4 is very famous. It takes glucose uh, into adipocytes and the muscle cells. So um, these are the four most famous GLUTs, GLUT1, 2, 3, 4. And for the other 10 different isoforms, unfortunately, for some of them, their substrates remain uncharacterized. Oh, besides, for these glucose transporters, despite their sequence similarity with each other, they actually uh, may have different binding affinity for glucose or for other uh, similar sugars, and they have different uh, uh, turnover rate. For example, GLUT1 can um, take up to 1,200 glucose per second, but that's yeah, that's very fast. However, GLU3, for GLU3, the number is 6,000. It's five times uh, faster than GLU1. And this is amazing. Because of their fundamental uh, significance in physiology, you can imagine uh, malfunction or misregulation of these proteins are associated with various diseases. For example, uh, GLUT1 deficiency syndrome is actually a, a rare genetic disease uh, manifested by early onset seizure uh, or retarded development. And the GLUT2, because it's associated with the liver, so uh, mutation of GLUT2 is uh, associated with a kind of uh, a type of disease called uh, falconi Bico syndrome. And um, more and more evidence showed that GLUT1 and GLUT3 are overexpressed in cancer cells, especially solid tumor cells, because of the so-called Wahlberg effect. 
uh, I just told you, without oxygen, one glucose can, can be converted to pyruvate. During this process, two ATP molecules are generated. However, um, in the presence of oxygen, uh, that is aromatic, oh, sorry, aerobic condition, um, about, I mean, over 30 ATP molecules can be generated. For solid tumor, it's usually under a hypoxic uh, condition. That's, um, you know, that means uh, it can only, one glucose can only generate two ATPs. Uh, consequently, more glucose transporters have to be over have to be expressed to take more sugar to uh, compensate for this demand. And for GLU4, um, it's very famous because of its association with uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus and obesity. So, um, as I just mentioned, glucose transporters belong to um, the so-called major facilitator superfamily. As a matter of fact, they are the prototypes of this uh, largest secondary active transporter family. And um, for members in this family, actually, they are widespread across species from bacteria to human being. And members in this family have a very broad uh, spectrum of substrates from ions, sugars, um, amino acids, or even peptides. And in terms of transport mechanism, if you watched part one already, uh, actually members in this family can be unipotters, sympotters, or antipotters. That's in terms of the orientation of the transport. And as I also told you, um, a general alternating access uh, model or mechanism has been proposed to account for all the secondary transporters, especially for MFS members, this works very well. And we thought that because glutes are the prototypes in the understanding of this family, so structure uh, and the biochemical characterizations of glutes may also shed light on the understanding of other members of this largest family. Okay, why is it a prototype? especially GLUT1, because it was one of the first transporters to be cloned and characterized. So let me bring you to the history. Um, actually, the characterization of glucose uptake into our blood cells can be dated back to about a century ago. And at that time, it was already uh, discovered that the uptake rate or the diffusion, at that time people don't know it's active transport, still call it diffusion. But one PhD student uh, found that the diffusion coefficient is actually concentration dependent, suggesting it was not free diffusion. And in 1948, Lviv in one paper speculated on the uh, active transport component, although he didn't specify whether it was protein or something else, but he just speculated there, there, there would be an active transport mechanism. And in the 1950s, Widas, in his very famous papers, proposed a so-called mobile solute carrier mechanism. As a matter of fact, this mechanism was so famous that um, all the secondary transporters in human are named after SLC. So for example, GLUT1 is actually, um, the gene name for GLUT1 is SLC2A1, but don't call it SLAC because scientists don't like that name, so it's SLC. And then, um, so far it's all about this component. And in 1977, the scientists actually were able to purify uh, the protein component from red blood cells and reconstitute them into liposome. And they reconstituted the uptake of glucose. So they named this protein component GLUT1. And then in 1985, uh, uh, Harvey Lodish lab cloned GLUT1. And the sequence, when the sequence was available, it was clear that this protein contains 12 transmembrane helices. And in 1990s, um, the study effort uh, was shifted to the pathophysiological investigations as well as structural characterizations because we would like to understand their structure, to see their structure uh, so as to understand its functional mechanism and disease mechanism. However, 30 years, almost 30 years passed. So what we learned from the textbook about the structure of GLUT1 was still this, the, um, the one published by Harvey Lodish in 1985. This is the topological structure. All right, um, 
So I started my lab in 2007, and we were very interested in the structure of glutes because we thought it could help address a lot of interesting questions. As listed here, of course, the first thing is you try to see the architecture of glutes. That's the most direct but superficial purpose. And uh, with the structure, we might be able to uh, reveal the molecular basis underlying the substrate selectivity why it selects glucose, but not, uh, for example, maltose. And with, because uh, we understand these transporters um, follow this alternating access cycle, so we'd like to reveal the conformational changes during the transport cycle, so to, under, uh, to understand their functional mechanism. And we also uh, uh, hope to provide a molecular interpretation for all these disease-related mutations. And um, for my own research, I'm also very interested in the difference, the mechanistic difference between sympotters, particularly proton sympotters and the facilitators. But I may not have time to go to details of this part. And uh, finally, uh, because membrane proteins are embedded in lipid bilayer, and we would really like to understand how they are modulated by lipids. And there are more and more questions they just emerge during your research. So to address these questions, we started not with glucose transporter, but their relatives. Their relatives from E. coli, which are technically easier than the human protein. So we determined the two structures of E. coli proton sugar sympotor, FUP and ZLE. So um, as the name indicated, they are proton sympotors, meaning they exploit this transmembrane proton gradient to drive the uptake of the substrate, uh, either alfucose or desalos, from a low concentration environment to the high concentration interior of the cell. In the past three years, we were uh, very lucky. We were finally able to determine the crystal structures of GLUT1 and its closely related uh, GLUT3 in three different conformations. That means they adopt different uh, states during a transport cycle, as shown here. So all the way from outward open, occluded, and inward open. When I say outward or inward, that refers to the substrate, substrate binding site. That is, remember for the alternating access, that is, um, the substrate binding site can never be exposed to both sides of the membrane. So it's always open to one side, substrate comes, and this protein undergoes conformational change to expose the substrate to the other side. This is called alternating access. So with these three structures, we have a relatively better understanding of this transport cycle of glutes. All right, first thing, to address the questions, the architecture, but before that, I know many people are interested in the crystallization of membrane proteins. And GLUT1 has been a target for several decades. Why um, we were able to crystallize and determine the structure of this very intriguing protein. To, in retrospect, there are three key elements that contributing to the crystallization of GLUT1 and give us um, the diffracting crystals. First, we actually introduce point mutations. First is to eliminate glycosylation, which really uh, represents major trouble for crystallization. And the other point mutation, glutamate 329 uh, glutamine, this one is a re disease-related mutation originally identified in GLUT4, and it was suggested to lock the protein in the inward open conformation, which was exactly the case as seen in our structure. And the second, uh, the detergent we used for crystallization is non-glucoside. Uh, I will come back later why this was important. And third, you know, for glucose transporters, they are highly mobile. So we would try to slow them down to lock them at certain conformation. So we did all the experiments at low temperature, at 4 degrees Celsius. That helped a lot. And to cut the long story short, on one particular day, uh, my students showed me these crystals, these tiny crystals. I thought probably they were uh, contaminations from insect cells. However, you know, it doesn't hurt to send them to synchrotron for data collection. And we sent this single crystal to uh, Shanghai synchrotron, and several hours later, we solved the structure. That was exactly our target, GLUT1. As shown here, this structure 
exhibits a very typical MFS fold, remember major facilitator superfamily. It contains 12 transmembrane helices um, with the first six one um, named the N domain or the N terminal domain and shown in silver and the C terminal one um, in blue. And very unexpectedly, we also see an intracellular helical domain. We name it ICH. Actually, this, do this little domain harbors a lot of uh, serine or threonine or uh, lysine. So these residues are probably uh, important for their post-translational modification. Um, now with this structure, we really can uh, provide uh, the answer to many questions. So as I asked at the beginning, so what is the mechanism of substrate selectivity? For this purpose, we actually examined through biochemical approach uh, the sugar selectivity by GLUT1 and GLUT3. Shown here is the results for GLUT3. As you can see, indeed, um, this protein has um, kind of a stringent selectivity. And when, when you, wherever you see this lower, um, this shorter bars, that means these sugars can inhibit the uptake of glucose, meaning that they can be recognized by GLUT3 to compete for uh, glucose binding. And when we examined these chemicals, very interestingly, we found one common feature, that is their C3 hydroxyl group all points to one orientation. So that means C3 hydroxyl group is important. That's the conclusion from uh, biochemistry from biochemical characterizations. Then uh, how is one sugar molecule recognized by the protein? So the answer is from the very high resolution uh, structure of GLU3. So we determined GLU3 in complex with a substrate D-glucose at 1.5 angstrom. And shown here is the omit electron density map. As you can see, it's beautiful. To our surprise, we identified, although we just you know, add glucose uh, to the protein, and we identified two different anomeric forms of glucose simply by the electron density map. As you can see, both alpha and beta glucose um, are present in the structure. I mean, I have to clarify. So one protein can only bind to one glucose, but for crystallography, you know, this is the average of many of me billions of molecules. So you know some proteins bind to alpha form, some bind to beta form. And this observation, this structure observation, actually settled down one long-term controversy, that is whether glucose transporters can recognize the alpha form of glucose. Because we know beta form is the uh, prevailing one, the dominant form in solution. And this observation shows, yes, GLUT1 or GLUT3, they can um, uh, bind and transport both uh, anomeric forms of D-glucose. All right, um, another interesting discovery is that, as I told you, glucose transporters has two uh, distinct domains, N domain and C domain. However, in the structure of GLU3 in complex with um, glucose, as well as in the structure of GLU1 in the presence of this determined molecule Ng, what is Ng? It is actually a derivative of glucose. So that's why Ng is important for us to capture the structure of GLUT1. It mimics the substrate binding. And if you compare these two structures, a common feature is the C domain provides the primary accommodation site for glucose. So C domain is the primary substrate binding site. Then what does the N domain do? All right, so um, before that, you know, we try to complete the alternating access cycle by, um, you know, in the attempt to capturing um, another confirmation, that is the outward open, because now we have GLU3 in complex with uh, glucose in the occluded confirmation, that is, uh, the substrate is trapped in, in, in the center of the transporter and isolated from either side of the membrane. And for GLU1, it's open to the in inside of the cell, so it's called inward open. Now we still need this outward open confirmation. In order to capture the outward open structure, we really had some rational thinking. So people always say crystallization is an art. It seems like you have to do a lot of screening. But in this case, we really did some rational thinking. That is, when we obtain the structure of GLUT1, I told you 
NG is important, right? So we introduce several factors like the mutation E329 to Q, that is to lock inward open conformation. And then when we see the binding of NG to the protein, as you can see on the tail, aliphatic tail of this detergent, it actually is uh, lining down on the intracellular vestibule when the sugar moiety is specifically coordinated by uh, the C-terminal domain. So along so basically, presence of this aliphatic, uh, aliphatic tail precludes the closure of these two domains on the intracellular side. That is to stabilize this inward open conformation. With this aliphatic tail, it cannot close, right? So along this line of thinking, um, we thought if we can find a chemical, a glucose derivative, that has some chemical groups on the other side, on the other side of the sugar ring. Probably that can preclude the closure of the protein on the extracellular side. That is to capture an outward open conformation. Do we have this kind of chemicals? Yes, we have a lot of disaccharides uh, that are derivatives of glucose. As shown here, we selected a few and we examined their ability to inhibit glucose of uptake, as shown here. Turns out maltose was a potent inhibitor. And when we checked literature, this was really consistent because maltose was regarded, uh, was suggested as the exofacial inhibitor. That means they can inhibit glucose uptake from the extracellular side. To cut the long story short, in the presence of maltose, we actually crystallize the protein in, using lipidic cubic phase. Um, it gave us two different structures. One is almost identical to, shown uh, on the left, is almost identical to the glucose bound uh, GLU3 and is occluded from, so maltose is bound in center, occluded from either side of the membrane. But the other crystal form gives us um, this outward open conformation. So this this was really a uh, serendipity. I mean, we just mix them together, they give us two different crystal structures. So I will focus on the illustration of this out of the open conformation and uh, with comparison of the inward open glue one and the occluded glue three. So now we have these three conformations I showed before. We could generate a morph that illustrates uh, the whole transport process. As you'll see here, um, out of the open arrival of glucose, and it undergoes this alternating access by um, the relative rotation of these two domains, and the substrate is released into the inside of the cell. And very interestingly, remember um, this small domain shown in yellow is the ICH, intracellular helical domain. And during the conformational change, you can see it also undergoes intradomain rearrangement. In a way, it restrains the N and the C domains from opening too much. So this uh, ICH domain, we name them the latch to secure this intracellular gate. All right, from that movie, you may thought, hmm, these two domains undergo a rigid body rotation. But close examination of the structures of the outward open and occluded GLU3 uh, suggests no, it's not a rigid body. Actually, we can see very sophisticated local rearrangement of the C domain elements. As shown here, the one shown in cyan is C domain, and the one in green um, is the N domain. Please pay attention to this PM7 motif. You can see it undergoes a bending, a bending, right? This is TM7 not only a bending. So when the side chains are, show, are shown, you will see it actually also undergoes a rotation. So this TM7 undergoes very uh, complicated local rearrangement by bending, a combination of bending and rotation. So whether this is uh, induced by substrate binding or this is the so-called uh, dynamic equilibrium remains to be further characterized. And our preliminary MD simulation suggests that this is uh, dynamic equilibrium. Even in the absence of substrate, you can see this kind of conformational change of TM7. Now, here's the question. Why the C domain shown in cyan is so flexible, whereas the N domain 
is just so rigid as a stone. And when we examine the interior of these two domains, the answer is really clear. So as shown here, the red dashes represent um, hydrogen bonds. As you can see, um, the interior of the end domain is really uh, hydrophilic. It, so the high resolution structure of GLU3 allows us to identify seven wa water molecules within the end domain of GLU3. And these water molecules together interact with a set uh, groups of many polar residues as a strip of hydrogen bonds. And this stabilizes um, the, uh, the end domain, so make them very rigid during conformational change. In contrast, the interior of the C domain is um, highly hydrophobic, hydrophobic, as shown here. So for these hydrophobic residues, um, they just contact each other through van der Waals interactions. So make the interior relatively greasy and easier for bending and the rotation. So the structure analysis really provides a good answer to account for the distinct features of N domain and the C domain during the alternating access uh, cycle. All right, now uh, shown here is the very simple uh, diagram of alternating access with our structures, the three structures, we are able to uh, up this model with more sophisticated features. As you can see, TM7 and also TM10, they undergo local conformational change. And the overall relative rotation of the N and the C domains uh, result in the alternating exposure of the substrate to either side of the membrane. And besides, please pay attention to these yellow bars. They are the intracellular ICH domain. We call them the latch, intracellular latch. OK, now with the structure, we were able to map the disease-related mutations. Um, shown here is an example of the mutations identified in patients with the so-called GLUT1 deficiency syndrome. So in total, more than 40 mutations were identified. So when we map them onto the structure of GLUT1, very interestingly, we realized that they clustered to three areas, as shown here. So Area one um, is really involved in substrate binding, and it's easy to understand. Mutations of this uh, cluster would affect substrate recognition or substrate binding, hence uh, compromising the transport activity. And class two, as shown here, highlighted by this cyan cycle, uh, the, the cyan uh, circle. Uh, so basically, they map to the interface between SAH N domain and the C domain, and they together constitute the intracellular gate. And not surprisingly, cluster three maps to the extracellular gate. So um, the structure really provides a beautiful answer to understand most of these disease associated mutations. So they either affect substrate binding or the two gate, hence uh, affecting the alternating access cycle of the protein. All right, now with this results, uh, we can address the questions asked at the very beginning, right? So we know the architecture, and it will provide a basis uh, to see the substrate selection. And uh, we reviewed three conformations of uh, GLUT1 and GLUT3 um, during the transport cycle, the alternating access cycle. And we provide some uh, answers to the disease-related mutations. and. Uh, with regard to the mechanistic difference between sympotors and facilitators, we are now doing some MD simulations and biochemical characterizations. So we have some tentative clues, but it really uh, awaits further characterizations. And now our focus is shifted to uh, the modulation of the transport activity by lipase, as well as uh, you know the kinetic study of transport cycles. And finally, we are very interested in the structure-based ligand design, because these proteins are important drug targets. So with this, I would like to conclude my talk by acknowledging the people who made this work possible. So Dong, um, he was my postdoc who has been 
the primary driver of this project. He has leading this team uh, of Tsinghua undergraduate students or graduate students uh, to elucidate the structures of both GLU-1 and GLU-3. And he's now a professor in Sichuan University. And this work uh, was uh, in collaboration with many colleagues in Tsinghua or in, uh, in the US, as shown here. And um, I'd like to thank you for watching this online seminar. <laughs>